Let's begin in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your prophet Isaiah, for your word, for your living word that spoke to your people then, just as they needed you, and that continues to speak now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the prism through which all of this comes to us. Holy Spirit, guide us now. Open us to your word and open your word to us. In, Je in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, congratulations on being here on the snowy January morning, uh, particularly on one where the regular Sunday school isn't meeting yet, and it might not have been clear whether we were or not, but some of us are diehards and we're here. Welcome. Glad to have you. We, this year we have been in the prophet Isaiah, and we're continuing in the prophet Isaiah. It's, um, there is so much stuff in this. This is the longest of the prophetic books. It's, I think it's the richest of the prophetic books. And there's such a variety of things going on and over quite a span of time that it's, it can be difficult to kind of keep track of what's going on as you go through. So for myself, I usually need some kind of framework to hang everything on. We don't always know exactly what, what situation each passage refers to, but if I can get the broad strokes, I feel like I'm starting to understand what's going on. And for these first 39 chapters of Isaiah, the broad strokes are Judah's and Jerusalem's struggle with the Assyrian invasions. Assyria is the empire that keeps taking, trying to take over and threatening them time after time. There were five or six waves of Assyrian invasion during these decades. And then during that same time, we've got two, two main kings of Judah. Um, Ahaz first in the early chapters, and now his son Hezekiah in these later chapters. These kings who are trying to figure out what to do with the, the problem, and Isaiah standing there trying to encourage them to a radical stance of trust. Um, that's the overall framework for these first 39 chapters. And the chapters that we're in now, that we've been in right before Christmas and now and next week, uh, are, appear to be dealing primarily with the second king, Hezekiah. Hezekiah, just to remind you, is, uh, turns out to be one of the best of Judah's kings. If you read the story of, of, kings, of the kings in the book of Kings or Chronicles, there are only two of the kings of Judah after David that get ranked up there with David as really um, genuinely wanting to serve the Lord and, and as good kings. One of them is Hezekiah. The other, a generation or so later, is King Josiah. Those are the two, those are the two top ones. But they're not at all perfect, neither was David for that matter. They're not at all perfect, and Hezekiah particularly takes a while to grow into this place of trust. Next week we will be in the last chapters of the first chunk of the book of Isaiah, um, chapters 36 to 39, and there we will we'll watch uh, Hezekiah finally come into his own, sometimes, except for when he doesn't. Um, I like Hezekiah because he is a believer and he's one of the saints and he's got clay feet like all the rest of us. Um, so that's next week. As we move toward that, um, we're in chapters now where he's not there yet. Last time we were together, we were certainly in chapters like that because he was tempted to put his trust in the rising Egyptian power as a help to him. He was putting his trust in his own armaments. And God was saying, no, that's not going to work. That's not going to be your rescue. The word that we heard last time was, in returning and rest will you be saved. In quietness and in trust you will be delivered. Which is a really difficult stance for any political leader to take. Any king to take. Any of us to take. Okay. These chapters now, 32 to 35, oh, one more word about Hezekiah. If you read the stories of Hezekiah in Kings and Chronicles, you'll see, you can, and you read carefully, you can watch him growing in his trust and in his reform of uh, Jerusalem and Judah. Um, his father had really sold out to Assyria. And you might right, right remember that when he asked for Assyria's help against those who were invading him, um, Assyria said, sure, we'd be happy to help out. Part of the price of that was that Judah became an underling of Assyria, and Judah was required to bring in an Assyrian altar 
to the Assyrian god and place it front and center in front of the temple while the, god, the altar of Yahweh was moved around the corner out of the way. They didn't have to stop worshiping Yahweh. It's just that the Assyrian god was the top dog. Um, so when, when you read in Kings and Chronicles and discover that, that Hezekiah initiates a reform movement and gets rid of all the pagan altars, um, he, had, he had to wait until he felt free enough to do that. He had to wait until he had some wiggle room under the Assyrian thumb to do that. And you know by now that was not only a religious statement, it's a political statement too. For him to throw out the Assyrian altar, the Assyrians are going to hear about that. That's going to call down reprisals because it's a, it's a declaration of independence as well as it's a declaration for the Lord. Does that make sense? That's some of what's going on here. And Hezekiah grows in his boldness and his willingness to stand for Yahweh alone. That's where we're headed. Isaiah 32. Um, I've entitled these chapters, A New King and a New Day. There are at least two passages in these chapters that talk about the promised king, the Messiah. Um, is it Hezekiah? Is it someone greater yet? Um, once again, as it's, it's interesting to me that whenever the prophets begin to promise this great new king, there's already a king on the throne. And so this is always a critique of the current king. It's a judgment of the current king, which now would be Hezekiah, because he hadn't gotten there yet. Um, it's a promise for the king that God will one day bring, and then it's also an encouragement for the current king to start to walk in that path. To say, oh, I guess that's my job description. Let me see what I can do about that. And Hezekiah actually begins to. I thought about entitling these chapters The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, <laughs> because there are some great promises, and there are some words of judgment, and there's an awful passage about terrible Edom and how God's going to wipe out Edom. And, but a new king and a new day will do just fine. Would someone read for us, please, chapter 32, verses 1 through 8. Behold, behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will hearken. The mind of the rash will have good judgment, and the tongue of the stammerers will speak readily and distinctly. The fool will no more be called noble, nor the knave said to be honorable. For the fool speaks folly, and his mind plots iniquity, to practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied, and to deprive the thirsty of drink. The knaveries of the knave are evil. He devises wicked devices to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But he who is noble devises noble things, and by noble things he stands. Thank you. It started out really nice, didn't it? Where did it go? So the word. So here, here is another depiction of the great coming king. A king will reign, and and here you can see the touch words of the uh, of what this king's reign will be like: righteousness and justice. You'll see those things over and over again. He follows God's way. And he sees to it that there's genuine justice in the land. And typically, as you look at those passages, it's justice for the vulnerable especially, so that the vulnerable are not crushed. Uh, over and over again, Isaiah is calling us to that. So this, this Messiah, this great king that will come, is a, a king that will come in righteousness and justice. Um, this passage is unique because the king's not alone this time. Who's he got with him? Princes, yeah. There's a government along with him. Um, so it's not only the king by himself, but there is a whole government with the king that is reigning in righteousness and justice. Look at verse 2. Have you heard that language anywhere else before? Streams of water in a, di in a dry place, the shade of a great rock in a weary land.
The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. Beneath the cross of Jesus? The cross. That, that hymn writer has picked up this line and applied it to the cross. But that's the king who is reigning in justice and righteousness and now is the shelter of a great rock in a weary land for us. Um, I love all these bits of, bits of scripture that have gotten pulled into hymns along the way and become deep, deeply part of our psyche. So this king reigning in justice with his government, his princes also ruling with justice, will be a protection, will be a hiding place, a covert, a nourishing place, streams of water, a shade from the, from the weariness. Um, it's a beautiful picture. Verse 3, verse 3, my voice is changing. <laughs> verse 3. Then the eyes of those who have sight will not be closed. Have you heard that language before in Isaiah? This has been a theme from near the beginning of Isaiah. When Isaiah first gets his, get, has his vision in the temple, and, and God and says, here am I, send me, and God puts him to work. And he says, what shall I, what shall I say? And God says, Speak to the people until they can't hear you anymore and can't see you anymore until they're totally blind and deaf. And that image of blindness and deafness runs through this whole book. Um, you know, watch it as it goes back and forth. So the blindness and deafness is, a, is an image of our denseness and our inability or unwillingness to listen to God and to, hear, and to see God's ways. But what's the promise here? They will see and hear. Their minds will be opened and their tongues will speak clearly. Notice how important it is when there is solid leadership, when there is just and righteous leadership. When there is, then, then all of us together begin to open up and to hear and to listen and to follow God's ways. And when the leadership itself is perverse or self-serving or twisted, um, the whole society ends up going that way. I think that's why the kings carry so much of the blame or praise in these stories. Their leadership is crucial. Verse 5. How do you hear that stuff about the, the fools and the villains? Why does Isaiah bring that in now? Why were fools called noble in the first place? Why were fools called noble in the first place? Have you ever been someplace where fools were called noble? Congress. I just heard someone say Congress. Congress. <laughs> Has that ever crossed your mind about our government, regardless of which persuasion you happen to be? Every day, right? Have you ever been uh, working in a business where the leadership of the business have been fools, but have been the top dogs and have been honored and considered smart? And but fools yeah. are never considered yeah. no schools. Principal never noble, because you knew better. Yeah. 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 When leadership of any kind is goes astray and is crooked and perverse and self-serving, too often it does happen in society that they're still lifted up as, as the examples and, as the, and, they're, and they're rewarded with great salaries and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think this is also a comment on how Judah's leadership has been, how their kings have been, and maybe even on King Hezekiah up to this point. Hezekiah, you're the king, but you've been stupid. <laughs> The time will come when this will be straightened out and the truth will be seen. When the king reigns in justice, then there's no more of that rewarding of the idiots or of the self-serving. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is altogether too modern, I think. Okay. These, th these chapters are kind of a grab bag, I think. I don't know if it was just they gathered up all, the, all that was left of Isaiah's messages and threw them in one pile here. The, the way they flow doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And yet that is the time that they're in. A time when God is trying to lead them forward and, bring, and promise them and lead them into the future. And at the same time critique what's going on. 
So now in verse 9, we have a sudden shift. Would somebody read for us, please, verses 9 through 14. Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In little more than a year, you will shudder, you complacent women, for the vintage will fail. The fruit harvest will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Shudder, you complacent ones. Strip and make yourself bare and gird sackcloth upon your loin. Eat upon your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people growing up in thorns and briars. Yea, for all the joyous houses in the joyful city. For the palace will be forsaken populous city deserted. A hill in the watchtower will become dens forever. A joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks. Thank you. Interpret, please. Something's going to happen. Living off the land is not the end. Okay. Why are these women being critiqued like this? Kind of lazy, maybe. Kind of lazy, maybe. There, we have a number of passages like we've hit one of these already early in Isaiah. There are a couple of other passages like this, and some of the other prophets too. Um, what kind of women are these? What class are they? The nobility. Nobility. Upper class, wealthy, yeah. Um, this is very much a patriarchal society, a society of male power and male domination. And in a society of male power and domination, what role do the women play? Especially the wealthy ones? They're ornaments, yeah. <laughs> They're trophy wives, man. Trophy wives, sure. yeah. Yeah, this is, this is part of the picture of a male-dominated society. These women, at least officially, have no power of their own, but they wield quite a bit of power behind the scenes. Uh, there's a passage in Amos that's like this, too, that are, what they're doing is they're saying to their husbands, come bring us drinks, and their husbands are out, are out oppressing the poor and crushing the needy to supply the lifestyle for these women. Uh, the women are every bit as much complicit in the domination society, as the men are, but they, they play a particular role in a, in a male-dominated world like this. And so their beauty, they're supposed to be beautiful, they're supposed to be ornaments, they're supposed to be lovely in the world, and instead they are going to be, uh, their beauty is going to be destroyed. Um, you are at ease, you are complacent, um, in a short time, all, all that's supporting your ease and your complacency will be stripped away. Um, beat your breasts for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people growing up in thorns and briars. So here's a, here's a wealthy class that's partying away, not even realizing that the life of the people is being, is being eaten away and crushed and destroyed. Um, that's a kind of picture of what's happening here. Um, there are other passages where the men get theirs too, just so you know. It's okay. Sounds like a little revolt coming. A little revolt coming? Could be. Now it's interesting, verse 14 the palace will be forsaken, the populous city deserted, the hill and watchtower become dens forever. It's an interesting word, forever. Look at the first word of it in verse 15. What kind of sense does that make? Destroyed forever until? Well, as far as humanly speaking, destroyed forever. And only God can intervene. Only God can bring the until. Would somebody read for us, please, 15 to the end of the chapter? Until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field. And the effect of the righteousness will be peace, 
and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. And the forest will utterly go down, and the city will be utterly laid low. Happy are you who sow beside all waters, who let the feet of the ox and the ass range free. Thank you. So what's going to make the difference? God. Yeah. As you read through this book of Isaiah, there's a real, um, there's, a, there's, there's an almost a hopelessness about human nature. Uh, with all the language of our blindness and our deafness and our hardness of heart and our thickness of mind, like God is trying and trying and trying to break through to us, and we just are dense and can nothing gets in. And God's trying over and over and over again. There's something about our character that gets so turned in that we, we don't know how to open up. And we need something from without to do that. And this is one of the places where, where the Bible starts to say, what can break through? Until a spirit from on high is poured out on us. Notice that language of pouring. It's like the spirit is liquid, living water. Until the spirit from on high is poured on us, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. And what will be the result of that? Justice. Justice and righteousness. The result of justice and righteousness peace and quietness and trust. There's that same language again. My people, you're trying to, you continue to try to build your kingdoms while they're going down the tubes. But when my spirit is poured out and finally opens you up, then you will be freed. Freed to listen to me and to follow and the result will be justice and the result will be quietness and peace. Pastor, don't you think that's how they felt when they built this church? I don't understand. This church was built a hundred years ago when immigration was coming in, and I just feel like that might have been the motivation. The pouring out of the Spirit? You bet. It was in my grandmother's era of the body. First thing they did was the as I read a chapter like this one, it's um, so it's taught, here's God dealing with Israel and God promising the ideal king, God promising Jesus, God promising his coming and the coming of the Holy Spirit that transforms our lives. Um, but at the same time, this is terribly modern stuff. This is what's going on in our world right now. And we're struggling to, to fix our broken political system, our broken societal system, and nothing's working. Maybe something from without. Can you speak to whom, to whom um, Isaiah is speaking? Now, is he is he being heard only by the the wealthy or the king or the ruling classes? What's happening to all the, the lower people in all this? It's kind of like you know you're just sort of stuck to kind of wait for things to happen. And is I mean obviously they're not reading. Are they hearing this in the temple? Are they how much do they have a responsibility? The prophets proclaim this stuff publicly. Um, exactly where they do is not always clear. We have a few examples where it talks they went to such and such a place and proclaimed. It does appear that Isaiah does, Isaiah is one who has access to the courts of power. And he has from the beginning. And so he appears to do a great deal of his proclamation in those courts of power. Whether he did it also out on the streets, that song of the, of the vineyard sounds like it's out on the streets. I don't really know. Whether he did it there or not, I don't know. And how the, how the common people may have heard. There's another prophet speaking at the same time, and that's Micah. Micah is a prophet of the common people. Um, and so he's, he's very much not a city guy. He doesn't think much of Jerusalem at all. Um, and he appears to be addressing more the, com the common people, but still laying the blame on the ruling classes. Yeah, exactly how they all heard, we don't know. But these were proclaimed publicly and then at some point written down and preserved. Um, we're kind of left in a lot of guesswork about who heard it when. Yeah. 
that verse 15, until a spirit from on high is poured on us. That's one of several prophetic passages now that, that promise a time when God will pour the spirit on his people. And that's what's being waited for, part of what's being waited for when Jesus shows up. Uh, and for John the Baptist to say, I baptize you with water, but among you stands one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's tying straight into this, into these prophecies. Okay. I just want to pick out a couple, a few verses of chapter 33. Chapter 33 is, is again kind of a mix. Uh, there are promises about deliverance from a, from a destroyer who's not named, but in context is probably Assyria at this point. There are, there's language about the, the mess that they're in beforehand and what God will do to restore that. Um, not all of the verses fit together easily well. It's hard to kind of follow through the chapter. But it's, I do want to pick out a few verses. Uh, verse 2 starts out as a prayer. O Lord, be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. Um, I think that's Isaiah's own prayer, praying, praying to God for deliverance. Um, the next verses are verses of um, invasion that the people are facing. But then verse 5, the Lord is exalted. He dwells on high. He filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Um, you get these little nuggets over and over again in Isaiah. But what kind of a God this is? A God of righteousness and justice. And he, he dwells on high. Uh, verse 10. After a description of the horrors that the people are going through, now a word from God. Now I will arise, says the Lord. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. You conceive chaff, you bring forth, bring forth stubble, your breath is a fire that will consume you, and the peoples will be as if burned to lime. The thorns cut down, they are burned in the fire. It's kind of a little grim, but it's God coming in judgment for the sake of his ravaged people. Um, it's good news for some, it's bad news for others. Okay. Verses 13 and 14. The coming of God into their midst isn't going to hit everybody in the same way. Yeah? Hear you who are far away what I have done, and you who are near acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with the devouring fire? Who among us can live with everlasting flames? Is that your favorite de depiction of God? The God that I serve is everlasting flames and devouring fire. Well, God is God and we are not. God is just and we are something else. Um, there's something about God whenever God shows up that we are either terrified, put in our place, or comforted, lifted, restored, or both. Or both. That's part of the experience of God. Verse 17. We get the king again. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will behold a land that stretches far away. So this promise of a king who will reign now in beauty and in extent of land and power. And look at the next verse. Your mind will muse on the terror. Where is the one who counted? Where is the one who weighed the tribute? Where is the one who counted the towers? What does that verse mean? Are we talking about a, an Assyrian overseer who was the, the spy of the Mm -hmm. The person who's on the ground in Israel seeing that the tribute is paid. Yeah. I think very likely that's what it is. The Assyrian agents who have been there taking the tribute, in charge, uh, counting it all. 
um, where, especially the where is the one who waited the tribute. That's the key, the key line there, I think, for that. I think at the same time, it's also where are all of those who were in power and thought they knew how this worked and thought they knew how the world works? Where are the ones who numbered all the numbers and counted everything just right and thought it all through logically? Um, that's what these kings have been trying to do, figure out what's the best way for us to solve this problem. And God says, you weren't able to solve it, were you? Our approach of the world, our managing of the world has not worked. Whether we were the ones who thought we were in charge, or whether it's the oppressors who have come in. The world works differently from that. Verse 19 helps clinch, I think, that it is the oppressors, the, the agents of Assyria. No longer will you see the insolent people, the people of an obscure speech that you cannot comprehend, stammering in language that you can't understand. Remember before Christmas when Isaiah was, they, they were complaining about Isaiah, and why are you talking to us like babies and saying all this, saying, it's all, it's all, it's all, a call, a call, a call. <laughs> talking baby talk to us, and Isaiah said, yeah, that's the only language you can understand, and so these foreigners are going to come in and they're going to talk to you in language like that. It's going to sound like tzala, 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 kala, kala, kala. That's all you're going to get. Womp, 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 womp. <laughs> this is a... Isaiah keeps reversing these things. Uh, no longer are you going to just hear womp, 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 womp. You will hear clear language. So look on Zion, the city of our appointed festivals. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, an immovable tent whose stakes will never be pulled up. There the Lord in majesty will be for us. Here's quite an image. The Lord will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams where no galley or with oars can go or stately ship can pass. What does that mean? Shallow water, broad. This is the this is the uh, Platte River, huh? a mile wide and an inch deep. The, the Lord will be for us a place of broad streams. First, an image of nourishment and plenty of water, but then also some kind of image of protection that the foreign galleys can't get at us. It's too strong a river, or something like that. Hmm. I love these images. Okay. Now, two more chapters, 34 and 35. When we reach chapter 40, the language is going to suddenly be very different. In a couple of weeks we'll talk about that, about those chapters 40 through 55, the kind of setting they describe. Um, the, the, the very different time